Board, and I have an announcement for the Marquette Elementary School graduates. Right after Mr. Yates speaks, would you please go out that door? We're going to get a picture of just the Marquette graduates. Um, bathroom. Well, Stuart, I think he was about six foot and 220, knew that if he hit her, he'd kill her. So he grabbed her, picked her up, and ran down the hall with her. There are many, many memories, and uh, I wish I could tell more, but I think I'll get into Stu Karstens. Courage of enduring might, so thy sons go forth to vanquish in the strength of right. Gladly lift we now our voices, thy dear name to sing, to thy shrine of truth and beauty, loving tribute bring. The spirit that was Lindblom lives on. It lives on in the hearts of those of us who trod its hallowed halls. It lives on, perhaps to some extent, through our loved ones and friends, to whom we may have imparted some measure of the truly kinder and gentler and certainly more gracious time in which we lived. My sons have asked me, Dad, what was it like to grow up in the 50s? <laughs> My reply has always been, better than you would ever believe. <laughs> Lynn Bloom provided for many of us a place of unequaled growth physically, socially, morally, culturally, and certainly academically. Come with me for a moment back to the 50s, to Keeler Hall. Listen as we sing the loyalty song, as one city championship plaque after another is solemnly placed on its walls. Savor the richness of the Elwood pipe organ, concert band, orchestra, and combined choirs. Can your mind lock in on this beauty? Can you return to a time of serving and loving someone else's children? Yes, this is Lindblom. The spirit lives on. It will continue to live on in us. And anyone who knows anything about education understands that the spirit of any school is dependent to a great degree upon the leadership of that school. Tonight, we honor one whose life exemplified that caliber of leadership, a leadership that called forth the very best in each of us. Thankfully, now 89 years young, he is with us tonight. For 26 years, Lindblom flourished during his principalship. He still holds the record of having been a Chicago principal at one high school for the longest time. The highest award that any student could earn at Limblum was the Golden Eagle. But there is an award even greater, and that is one described in the tribute of love, as I quoted, proudly stands thy royal eagle, wings widespread for flight. Tonight, it is my honor to present to our principal teacher, counselor, and friend, the Royal Eagle Award. And in so doing, I present to all of you the true 
Royal Eagle, Mr. Lindblom, Harry F. Yates. Eagle at our 40th reunion by the classes of 1952. His talk will take about 15 or 20 minutes, and since he cannot hear a thing, I hope you'll give him the time, and thank you. Thank you, Marvin, for that very lovely introduction. I was reading his speech while he was giving it. I also want to thank Betty Babbage for giving me an invitation back to another night of Lindblom memory. <clears throat> thank you. I would like to take you back tonight to a time before you were born and before Lindblom was built. And I'd like to tell you about Lindblom's neighborhood. And since this is the last time you will ever hear your old senile principal speak <laughs> before he goes into the land of the setting sun, I'll tell you something about him also. <clears throat> the year is 1914. At that time, my mother ran a little grocery store at 60th and Wood. My father was a policeman. We lived in back of the store, and I attended Earl School, three blocks, three half blocks east of Lindblom. Also at that time, the streets were paved with cedar logs. They were little logs about eight inches long, placed side by side with the end grain up, and dirt filled in between the little logs. In other words, it was like a wooden cobblestone street. But later that year, the city pulled up all those little logs, and they put them on the parkway, and they paved the streets as you know them today. And all the neighbors, including little Harry, hauled those logs in our woodshed, which we burned in Ben Franklin's great invention, the stove, and around which I dressed on many a cold winter morning. Also at that time, there was no Wallacott. It was named for what I consider America's greatest president. It was called Lincoln Street. And there was no Damon. It was called Roby Street. And there being no tracks west of Lindblom were on the ground. My buddies and I used to take our net and buckets and we'd stay in the creeks alongside the tracks for pollywogs and frogs and salamanders and bring them home and put them in our backyard aquarium. And on the way home across that great big empty prairie, we'd pick up a brown or green garter snake and put in our pocket to be used later on to scare the girls. <clears throat> also at that time, there were about a dozen frame houses on Lindblom's lot. And I saw those houses raised off of their foundation, floated on two great big timbers about 18 inches square the length of the house. And they were rolled down the street on rollers about eight inches in diameter and about four feet long. The men used to take them from the back of the house and put them in the front as the house was pulled along by a steel cable, which in turn was hooked into a turnstile, and the turnstile in turn was hooked into a manhole in the street for traction. And two horses pulled that tongue of that turnstile around, stepping over the cable each time they went around, and the house slowly moved down the street to the new foundation in an empty lot. After all those houses were cleared off, they dug the foundation with a big scoop about three feet across that again was pulled by two horses. 